yourself or cell phones and we're doing yes, things. No. We're not texting or anything like that, but we broadcast our service on Periscope. And we record our uh, service and post it on YouTube at the end of the service. So what we see here is not the breadth of who we reach. Uh -huh. Amen? We reach people, and we've had as many as 85 that have been watching on Periscope. So um, if you wanted, you may want to let us know and stay out of the camera, but no. <laughs> Um, but we just praise God for the opportunity and um, the ability to reach out past these four walls. Amen. Because many times church is only in the four walls of the church. And that is not what Love Christian Center is called to. We're called to the community and we come in to worship, we depart to serve. Amen? Amen. Amen. So um, let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you once again for your darling son, Jesus. We thank you for your precious Holy Spirit who dwells in us, Lord, who touches us, who heals us, who gives us everything that we know we need, Lord, and even some things we don't know we need. So, Lord, we thank you. I ask that you touch my mouth that I may speak boldly of those things that you have given. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 So I have a question for you. A lot of times I'll start off with a question. How many of you like to wait? Do anybody like to wait? No. Mm -mm. You've been told you're going to receive something, but you haven't gotten it yet, and you have to wait. You trust the person that said they were going to give it to you, but they haven't yet. The minutes turn to hours, the hours turn to days, the days turn to months, and the months turn to years. You believe they're good for it because, after all, they've shown themselves to be a trustworthy person. You've never seen them go back on their word, but how long should you wait before you ask for what they promise? Or should you ask? After all, they're the ones who said they'd give it to you, so do you really have a right to ask for it? Because, in fact, until they decide to give it to you, it's theirs, and they can still change their mind. But the thought is still in your head. They said they were going to give me that thing. But when? Did they forget what to do, what to do, and what do I do in the meantime? Let us go to 1 Samuel chapter 16. We've got two scriptures. And it's going to be the beginning and the end of this story. The first one is 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13. Put your finger there, and then we're going to go to 2 Samuel, chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. When you have it, let me hear you say amen. 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 I told uh, some folks last week, the Pastor Ed preached, we're, we're in the same spot. And we don't talk about what we're going to preach when we uh, are preparing. So we know the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding us. Amen? Amen. And 1 Samuel 16 and 13 says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. And over in 2 Samuel chapter 5, Verses 3 and 4 says this, So all the elders of Israel came to, the king to, came to the king to Hebron, and King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed king, David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for 40 years. Our message title today is Running for Your Life. Last week, Pastor Ed told you how David prepared in the pasture for the palace. And I'm going to talk about another phase of David's life. David has now been anointed by Samuel as the king of Israel. The scripture says at a young age, but it seemed like nothing changed. Samuel went back to Ramah, and David went back to tending the sheep. He had, in a private ceremony, been anointed the next king of Israel. But Saul was sitting on the throne. 
How could this be, and when was it going to happen? He couldn't tell anybody because the king would try to kill him. Kingship was ruthless in those days. There were wars and coups and uprisings from outside of the kingdom and even from within. And now that God has had enough of Saul, his spirit departs from Saul, leaving him with a tormenting spirit. When you don't have the Holy Spirit, it leaves room for other things to come into your life, for unnecessary trouble, unnecessary worry, and unnecessary problems. It's better to keep the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, amen? amen. And how many know that the Holy Spirit will not dwell in an unclean place? Amen. If you have sin in your life, which is intentional, you know it's wrong, the Holy Spirit can't dwell in that place, amen? amen. So you would think when the prophet shows up at your house and anoints you king, this would be a good thing, right? I mean, it's a big deal to be king, like president of the United States. But David is still out with the sheep. But then some things began to happen. Saul was having issues. He wanted help calming that tormenting spirit, and God had an answer. Saul's people suggested getting a person skilled at playing the harp. And Pastor had told us last week, David was out in the field practicing his harp playing for his sheep. Well, guess who came to mind for them? And not only that, here's what Saul's men said about David. He's Jesse's son. He's a talented harp player he's been practicing. He's a brave man of war. He has good judgment. He's a fine looking young man. The Lord is with him. The Lord is with him. Yes, they were right because in 1 Samuel 16, 13, it says the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. When you have the spirit of the Lord dwelling in you, you can do some stuff. You can do some extraordinary stuff. You can do some stuff people won't be able to understand. When you have the Spirit of the Lord dwelling in you, it's not, and not just dwelling, let him have control. Let him drive. Let him lead. Trust him. He knows where you're going. He's the ultimate GPS. When you follow his directions, he never has to recalculate. Amen? How many of you have had your GPS tell you, recalculate because you, you missed the turn, you missed the exit, and you got to go back and figure out, okay, how do I get back to where I go? But you know, it has miles. Have you noticed when you missed your turn and you look, because when you've got those GPSs that tell you how far you've got to go, and when you're going to get there, and when you miss your turn, yeah. it adds on time. Amen? Amen? How many of you know it's the same way with the Lord? All right? He's giving us directions. And when he tells us to go left and we go right, we missed our turn, and we just added a whole bunch of time to our destiny. Amen? We want to make sure we stay with the GPS so we don't, we don't have, because God's not going to recalculate. Okay? He's not, he knows where he wants you to go. He's not going to recalculate like your GPS. We need to have to do the recalculation. Amen? Amen. Amen. So there's some debate about how old David was when Samuel anointed him king of Israel, but he was somewhere between the age of 10 and 13. While David didn't spread that around, it's assured that Saul heard about the visit that Samuel had to the house. But David trusted God and he respected Saul as his king. Can you, still, can you still respect your leader when they're acting unrespectable? How about your boss, the person that's in charge of the committee that you're on? David taught us so much with his actions. What he did was not contingent upon what Saul did to him. David never retaliated against Saul. He served him, and he did it with excellence. When the Spirit of the Lord dwells in you, you will do things with the spirit of excellence. Okay is not good enough. Let's just run down the list of David's life after he was anointed by Samuel and before he was crowned king. The promise was there, but there was more preparation to do. He was still tending sheep for his father because the sheep still needed tending. There were no other brothers to take it on. He was the youngest. The sheep didn't care that David had been anointed by, Saul, by um, Samuel. They knew their shepherd, and David still had a job to do. So he did it, and he did it well. David didn't think it was beneath him to do that job. You see, just because you get into a position of leadership, it doesn't mean you stop working. In fact, a good leader knows you lead by example. Thank you. People are watching you, and good leaders have the respect of those they have charge over. David has been anointed king, 
but he's now also being called on to play music to soothe the king. So the king is playing for the king. He's in the palace, but he's being a servant. A good leader knows how to serve others. In fact, in the kingdom of God, we're all about serving others. We're all called to serve one another, and those called out are especially to serve others. Jesus said, if you want to be great, become the least. Help others. Don't assume you're supposed to be at the head table when you were a last minute fill-in on the list. You were made a promise. You were given a position. Continue to serve. Continue to do what God has called you to do. David becomes an armor bearer to the king. Okay, he's getting closer. He's closer to the king, but there's a saying that says, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Saul was not David's enemy, but David was quickly becoming Saul's enemy. And Saul began to try to take him out. He tried to kill him while he was serving him, playing his harp, and Saul threw a, sp a spear at him, not once, not twice, but three times. But David was not only quick, the spirit of the Lord was with him, and Saul missed. Then David defeats Goliath. David continues to operate in his character. One of the phrases used to describe him was a brave man of war. Don't let a title change who you are. You receive the title because of who you are. Now that you have it, use it to make someone else's life better. Use it to help someone else. Use it to do good for someone else. Now he becomes best friends with the king's son, Jonathan. When the Spirit of God is on you, people will be drawn to you. They will recognize the Spirit that resides on the inside of you and be drawn to it. Stay humble. Amen. Amen? And now, David is banished from Saul's court, but made commander in Saul's army. The tormenting spirit is really messing with Saul. Saul has tried to kill David himself a few times, and since he's such a great warrior, Saul decides to let someone else take him out. But God. Do what God has called you to do and let him deal with the enemies. Amen? You see, if David had stopped to address what Saul was doing, he wouldn't have been able to fulfill his call, the mission that God had on his life. Saul's daughter falls in love with David. Remember their description of him. He's a fine-looking young man. Y'all, she saw him, she said, mm, that man. I want him, Daddy. Can any daddy that has a little girl deny his little girl? Mm-mm. And Saul allows him to marry her after trying to set a death trap because he's still trying to kill David. He knows that David is coming in after him, but uh, he's trying to take him out. Like that's going to stop the plan of God. How many of you know nothing can stop the plan of God? Amen? Amen? He made a demand for David, and he was surely going to get David killed, so he thought. When you have the Spirit of the Lord with you, people are drawn to you, even your enemy's family. First, Saul's son, Jonathan, and David became best friends. Then Saul's daughter falls in love with David. David's got to go on, y'all. He's fine, and he's a warrior. But Saul uses this as an opportunity to once again try to take David out. He says, okay, you want her? Because we know that David tumbled and David said, hey, I, I, don't, I don't have what it takes to be the son-in-law of the king. I don't have anything. My family doesn't have anything. I'm the youngest. What can I give? Saul said, no problem. It's going to cost you 100 Philistine foreskins. And if the kids don't know what that is, that's when you get home. That meant he was going to have to kill 100 Philistine men because you know that they're not just going to give that up, right? And uh, take their foreskins. Well, they would apparently love Michael too, Saul's daughter, because he and his men, when you're, leader, when you're a leader, people will follow. But he and his men came back with not 100, but 200 Philistine foreskins. Don't just do the minimum. Go above and beyond what you're asked by man. To, get, to be who God has called you to be. Remember, we operate in the spirit of excellence, not just enough. Saul's plans are not working. David is supposed to be dead, and now he has to start running for his life. Saul is getting more desperate, and now he's openly trying to kill David. Your enemies will sometimes be bold enough to come straight at you and try to take you out. How will you respond? Will you fight back? 
Or will you let God fight your battle? After all, he's the one that gave you the assignment, the appointment, the position, the title. Do you really need to fight for what God has already given you? Sometimes. But a relationship with him will let you know when to fight and when to run. Now this running is not just a running away. David was still leading even in his, in his running. So David runs to Ramah, and if we remember back in our first scripture, that's where Samuel lived. And he went specifically to tell Samuel what was going on, because after all, Samuel was the one that anointed him in the first place. So David was probably saying, look, you brought all this on in the first place. I didn't ask you to come over here, and you came over here and did this. Now this man's trying to kill me, and I didn't even do anything. Sometimes people will try to take you out, not because of anything you've done, but just because of who you are who they see in you, amen? Sometimes you want to go back to the source of when the problem started. All David had done was show Saul the respect that he was due. He served him diligently with excellence and Saul was still trying to kill him. Sometimes people are not gonna like you just because of who you are, because they see something in you they wish they had, so they're jealous. You keep being who you are and let them deal with their own issues. Let God handle them. Because Saul heard David where David was, he sent men to kill him. The men saw Saul with a band of prophets, and they began to prophesy. It happened to two more groups who were supposed to be killing David, and when Saul showed up, he began to prophesy too. You see, God is no respecter of persons. You get in the right crowd, and his blessings can fall on you too. His anointing can fall on you too. The company you keep, it matters. Amen? Amen. Children, the company you keep, Amen. it matters. Who you hang out with at school, it matters. Because if they do something wrong, they're not going to take time to find out who did what. They don't care. They're going to take everybody in, and everybody's going to be charged with the same thing. Everybody's going to get expelled at the same time, or suspended, or at detention. Something. Amen? They don't care. Amen. But David is still on the run, and he now runs to Nob, where he gets some help from the priest Ahimelech, who later pays for that with his life. He and 85 other priests and the whole town of Nob were killed because they helped David. Sometimes your help might get in some trouble. But you know what? If you're doing what God has called you to do, that's not on you. Amen. Saul had lost his mind and killed all of those people because they helped one person, David. So David leaves there and he flees to a chish and pretends to be crazy to keep from being killed. Sometimes you gotta act outside your character to keep from being taken out, amen? He hides in a cave and others who were outcasts heard about it and came to join him. He's a leader, they're following him. Wherever he goes, people are going to follow. When you're a leader, it doesn't matter where you are. Even when it appears that you're alone, someone is always watching. Someone always sees you. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little mouth, what you say. Be careful, little hands, what you touch. And be careful, little feet, where you go. Because somebody is always watching, amen? But David is now about 400 strong. But he's on the run. It's kind of hard to be on the run with 400 folks following him. But God is with him. Amen. Not only did the other outcasts come, his parents came. And he put them in a safe place. He took care of his parents. Sometimes your enemy will try to use those you love to get at you. He may attack them or even try to kill them to get at you. When you're connected to a leader, you must be you must be prayed up also. You must be careful also. You must be watchful also. Because your life and well-being may depend on it. David may still be on the run, but he's still a great warrior. The men described him as the men described him when they recommended him to Saul. You don't stop being who you are when you go on the run. And in his great warrior fashion, he liberates the town of Keilah from the Philistines. Now remember, the Philistines were these giants. Amen? And Saul and his men are taking them out. Our David and his men are taking them out. Well, Saul hears about it. 
and he sends troops to take David out again. So David runs again because the very people he helped free will betray him. God will let you know when something's going to happen. When you follow God and His Spirit dwells in you, He's not going to leave you unaware or unprepared. Sometimes you got to move, amen? David runs to Ziph. Saul follows, and God hides David. Saul chases David to another place called Engedi, where David is once again hiding out in a cave. Saul was so close to David that David cut a piece of his robe, and Saul didn't even know it. David could have taken Saul's life right then, but instead, he just took a little piece of his robe to get his attention and prove he meant him no harm. It happened again in Hekala, and David was betrayed by the Ziphites a second time. If someone shows you who they are, believe them. Amen. Amen. Don't try to make them better than they are. If they show you, believe them. Amen. Eventually, Samuel, Saul, and three of his sons all die on the battlefield in one single battle. And because Saul has spent so much time, energy, and manpower trying to kill David, he hasn't taken care of his kingdom. The country is now divided into the north, Israel, and the south, Judah. Now that Saul has died, David is finally anointed king of Judah, and he reigns there for seven years and six months until King Ishbosheth, 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 who ruled the northern kingdom of Israel, was killed. Most kings back then didn't die a natural death. Then David was anointed king over all of Israel, the north and the south, and reigned another 30 year, 33 years, giving him a total reign of 40 years. Understand, God may give you an assignment, an appointment, a position, or a title, but it may take some time before you start walking in that promise. Don't despair, don't give up, and don't sit down. David was anointed somewhere around the age of between 10 and 13 years old, but didn't walk in that promise until he was 30 years old. That means David waited somewhere around 20 years to walk in his calling of being a king. We're told something, and we don't want to make, wait 20 seconds, 20 minutes, 20 hours, 20 days, 20 months. Will you wait 20 years? Not me. He didn't worry about the promise. He didn't fret. He didn't ask God, how long was it going to be? He didn't say, this is so unfair. He didn't complain, and most importantly, he didn't try to make it happen himself by killing Saul. He understood the anointing of God and how special that is. You see, people don't always act like who God has called them to be, but it doesn't change the fact that they're anointed. Amen? So we have to be very careful. The scripture says, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. So we don't know who's anointed and just because they're not acting like it doesn't mean that they aren't. So we got to be very careful. Amen? We got to be careful with our tongue. This little Thing that can't be tamed. Amen. And what we say? Amen. So if God has given you an assignment and someone else is currently in that position, don't fret. Don't scheme to take them out. Join in. Learn and prepare for when your time comes. If you're a leader, lead where you are. David led even while he was running for his life. He remained true to his nature and character. He stayed obedient to the spirit of God that was on the inside of him. They had received a promise from God and kept, and God kept that promise, but there was some running that went on between the time the promise was made and when the promise was fulfilled. What has God promised you and you're waiting for it to be fulfilled? See, there was also some training that was still going on in that thing. There were some lessons that David had to learn. There were some things to do. David got to practice in the cave with the 400 men before he was to lead an entire nation. So sometimes you got to start small, and then God will grow you into a bigger thing. But everything is important. It all matters. It all comes to pass, okay? There was a promise God gave to the world, and that promise is still good today. And it's found in Romans 10, 9 and 10, and it says this, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. 
That promise is one that is clear, and you don't have to wait 20 years for it. You can have that promise today if you've never claimed it. That scripture is for whosoever will. You don't have to be a certain race, color, or gender. You don't have to be from a certain family. You don't have to have money. You don't even have to have a job. All you need is a desire in your heart. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came so that you might have life, not just any life, but life more abundantly. A life filled with peace, the love, and the joy of the Lord. You see, those don't come with conditions. Those are not situational. Those are not determined by external forces. When the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you, you determine how your life is going to be by how you react to what comes at you. If you respond negatively to things, you're going to see negative things. If you respond positively to things, you're going to see positive things. It's all in how you look at the situation. Anybody ever read a horoscope and you come out and it says you're gonna have a bad day and you have a flat tire and you say, oh, I knew I was gonna have a bad day. I got a flat tire and you're not looking at anything else. You read your horoscope and it says you're going to have a great day and you go out and you get a flat tire and you call AAA and they come and change your tire and you say, ooh, praise the Lord, AAA, I got AAA and they came and changed my tire. It's a great day. Same situation. It's just all in how you look at it. Right now, God is saying, I've given you an opportunity. I've given you a gift. It's free. Not much free stuff today. That's not, not that anything that's worth having. Right Amen? Amen? This is the case where it, it, it um, they say, look at the cost and you know how much it's worth. But this is free. And it's worth everything. There's no price that you can put on this. The gift of God, his son, Jesus Christ. If you have never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, today is a good day. Stop running for your life and trust in Jesus. He can take you off the track. Amen. The Olympics are going on now. I think they're getting into the track and field. You don't have to get on that track. And for us, it's typically a treadmill. You're running, but you're not going anywhere. Amen. Let's stop running. Let's get off the treadmill and get on Jesus' team. Amen. Let us stand. If you never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we invite you to come at this time. We invite you to give Jesus your heart, give him your life. He can do great things with it, more than you can ever do with it by yourself.